I want to introduce our panelists. There is Vince Horn, we know, our Buddhist geek. <laughs> uh, Ethan Nickturn, the Inter Interdependence Project, who just gave a great talk this morning. Um, our mystery guest, Jack <laughs> Hornfield, who oh. is... Uh, pioneer, changing Buddhism in the West, and Diana Winston from the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA. So I just want to introduce our panel by saying that in some way I think um, the Buddha was the original Buddhist geek. He was using all the technology of his time uh, to develop uh, access to realms of consciousness that were really unconstrained by time and space, by those boundaries, uh, just like the virtual world that's being created today. And the Buddha was a scientist who very much wanted us to be able to duplicate his enlightened, awakened, wise, compassionate results in the laboratory of ourselves, including his having created a community, a harmonious, um, or at least uh, a co-emerging harmony conflict e community where there were pretty wise rules for how to work things out to live harmoniously together. So I think for us, how do we carry forward and continue to build on these experiences that have been honed and transmitted through people's actual lived experience throughout the centuries and I was just in central Java um, at Borobudur, which is a Buddhist, it's actually the largest Buddhist temple in the world, and it was built in the ninth century. And it's a stupa, but it's, uh, it's created, and I brought a book, I'll leave it here for you to look at, it's a beautiful book. Um, it's created so that you walk on different levels, and you start out with the level of our conventional worldly existence, our desires, our brains, where we haven't yet learned how to you know, uncouple our brain systems and deactivate our amygdalas and are still very reactive to everything. And, uh, and then we go to the level where there's the life of the Buddha and then the life of the bodhisattvas. And it goes all the way to the top, which is, of course, the awakened, illuminated level. And what happens is that each, it is actually, as you do the circumnambulation, uh, it's a lived experience of consciousness being transformed in the uh, experience of looking at these stories which are done in beautiful sculptures. And I bring it up here because for me it was a perfect example of the wisdom of the ages, people who created something brand new, this design had never been done before, and who took the Avatamsaka Sutra, these great Mahayana teachings, and figured out how to express them in stone sculptures that would be accessible to illiterate people, um, and succeeded in creating something that speaks to us, what, 1,200 years later. And there's really no way of knowing how the virtual worlds, how the worlds that are being created now and by the next generations, what Buddhism, what the Dharma will look like. But after having that experience, I have a feeling that even 1,200 years from now, in the, what would it be, 33rd generation, 33rd century, um, that this, that there will be something deeply familiar to the heart, that the teachings of wisdom and compassion will speak uh, just as strongly and deeply to 33rd century inhabitants as Borobudur spoke to those of us who were just there. So I want to turn over to our panelists and begin this conversation together and start with Vince. Vince and I have had um, some great conversations in the past about this topic, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I was there in Java with you to see this amazing stupa, it sounds brilliant. Beautiful 
pictures. Why didn't I get an invite? I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, when we were talking before the panel, kind of preparing for this conversation, I was thinking about, especially being, I guess you could call like a next generation. I guess I still count as next generation. I'm kind of on the cusp of the Y and X thing. Uh, I was thinking about what I really want from my teachers, what I really want from the traditions I'm part of. I was thinking like, what do I need? And that's what I would bring to this conversation, just to throw it out there, um, hoping that it's reflective of other people's experiences. So one thing I thought of that doesn't get talked a, a whole lot about is I actually need resources. I need support. I need connections. You know, I have this Buddhist Geeks project. It, it, it's so amazing. Every time someone offers something, uh, some sort of gift, it's, it's, it just feels so great to have that. And in the same way, I know that uh, in order to really practice well and to understand these teachings, like I, I just felt like I really need support. Um, and I wanted to just throw that out there as uh, something I know we talk about. I, I definitely have support when I come on retreats, etc. But how else mm -hmm. Does this generation that's coming up get support um, from our elders, from the people who've spent so much time, you know, exploring these things themselves? Like, what's what's the best way to to get that information? You know, to get it transmitted. Um, is there an app for that? I'm wondering, like the Elder <laughs> Buddhism app. <laughs> we do have an Inside LA app. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so anyway, just just a, a question, really. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody want to respond? About resources? And support. I mean, I th it feels to me that, um, that I've noticed certain teachers, for instance, like Jack Kornfield and Judy Goodman, in the pioneer generation who are really making an effort to offer resources to the people of the younger generations and upcoming teachers and practitioners. I'm also sort of in a bridge generation. And, um, and, I, and I think that they're out there and it's something, it's sort of what Ethan was saying, people have to actually come and go and use it. And so part of it is the, is the resources are there, but will people come? Will they, will they make the effort? So I think there's tons of resources out there and you can still go practice in Asia. You can, I mean, there's, there's a bit of a glorification around the, um, these first generation teachers who went and did all their practice in Asia. Well, keep going, go, why, why not? So, um, so that, the wealth of the ancient traditions is there, the wealth, we actually, I think we're really lucky. I think that my generation, upcoming generation, is incredibly lucky by the incredible amount of, of teachings and resources that exist, whether, obviously, we're not gonna get our answers through Wikipedia, but um, we might get some, I don't know. Well, I, I do think, which I, I think I was trying to allude to earlier, that in terms of resources, the, the, the main thing that people are, are looking for, um, I think, is two things. Um, people want to hang out with other people. Mm. Um, and especially, I think there's a, there's a superficial aspect to that, too, which is people want to hang out with other people they're interested in and attracted to and can get their regular community resources. So, you know, like for, I remember when I <clears throat> first started taking um, classes at the New York Shambhala Center when I was 17, and I was the, the youngest person in a class of 15 people by literally 20 years, which that's changed a lot in the last 15 or 16 years, but that was the way it was. And I just said, this is not where I'm gonna talk about a tribe called Quest. This is not going to happen here. So you had to divide your regular community resources from your Dharma community resources. And I think the, the more that um, uh, people, people have Sangha, that they can actually get both of their sort of regular resources and their Dharma resources from, it's, it's more integrated. And then the other thing I think in terms of resources is, you know, it's different in different communities, but what I hear reported all the time is, it's not hard to find a teacher in the sense of like a teacher's books, but a teacher whose class you can go to every week or you can check, have a one-on-one -on -one time with every month. For most people I talk to, especially if they don't live in one of these few cosmopolitan centers with a lot of, of um, Buddhist centers like New York, 
oddly has kind of become like a mecca for Buddhism and the Bay Area and here. If you don't live in one of those places, it's very hard to find, you know, what we would call Kalyanamita or Kalyanamitra, you know, like a spiritual mentor. And so I think we are, and I think there's still some, I know this because I work with um, some Buddhist teachers and have a strong interest in Western psychology, you know, as well, that we're still at this point where we don't really know what a Dharma teacher is as a livelihood model. Mm -hmm. So those resources are still kind of lagging behind and meanwhile the psychotherapists are saying well if you guys you know cognitive behavioral therapy for example saying if you guys don't want to use this stuff we'll we'll take it and charge a lot of money for it and we can make a living off of it so um <laughs> and um so i think it's still this in-between phase where we're not sure what the model for the teacher resource actually is yeah and and also uh, i think dharma communities eventually hopefully will become complete communities where you know your uh all of your interests also um uh, are included in your dharma community interests could i could i res kind of yes. respond to yes. the diana's point because I, I think yeah. you're right that they're in my experience the resources are there and i've certainly been one to kind of go out and get them or find them um but then it's kind of like the analogy I think of is like, okay, we have plenty of food to feed people, but then how are resources allocated? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I feel like there's this sort of generational divide. And I, mm -hmm. I've talked a lot about this with friends like Rohan, and I don't think it's any fault of any particular people in the generation. It just seems like we're in a time where things are changing so rapidly with technology that the divides are, between generations are actually getting bigger. So like mm -hmm. when I grew up, you know, just completely immersed in the digital world and then I go to retreats there's an expectation that everything is going to be physical uh completely physical um like I can't really get access to someone unless it's physically uh, for the most part and so it, it's this feeling and, I, and I've kind of reflected with friends of mine that it's difficult to get those resources in the ways that we naturally find them not to say that we want the dar the internet to be our dharma teacher but rather why can't I Skype with some of my Dharma teachers occasionally? Or why, you know, there, there's a way in which the resources are set up uh, differently from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And that there's this sort of gap that's very difficult to traverse, I've found, um, which is part of the reason I, I suspect that there aren't a lot of uh, you know, younger people statistically that are getting into Buddhism right now. Um, so anyway, I just want to throw that out there as a kind of counterpoint. And, and my experience has been that that's changing, but it still feels like a painful divide, at least from where I'm sitting. Yeah, I, th I think um, for me, it, coming from a different generation, that I feel that divide as well, and I don't even know quite how to bridge it. Mm. Um, but I don't think that people aren't coming in. There was a conference that you were at that's kind of a sister or brother conference to this of Wisdom 2.0 in Silicon Valley last February. Some of you might have been there. And there were about 400 people or 450 people that were part of it and the panels included some of the founders of Facebook or Zynga or some really key players in the, in the Valley. Um, but the interesting part for me is that it was live streamed and there were 250,000 people watching it online. Um, and when somebody, I think it was Sharon Salzberg asked how many people in the room had a yoga or meditation or some form of Dharma practice, the majority of hands went up. And it was partly self-selected, that's the people who came, but it somehow gave a sense to me that actually there was a tremendous amount of interest in a new language, what you're doing, what Ethan's doing, that there's some way in which you are using a whole new culture and language that isn't part of my generation, really, and speaking that language. So I feel like it's happening, and I, I'm a little bit at a remove, not out of lack of wanting to do it, but partly because it's not my language. Right. Um, Wish you could just learn C++ and we could well, speak it, the same language. <laughs> it's Come a on, little, Jack. It's, it's funny. I mean, it's a little my language. I was at Dartmouth when BASIC was invented, you know, and then back, which is sort of like chiseling in Mesopotamia or something like that. And also, funny, um, one of the ways I, I, when I dropped out of college, um, I worked at Harvard Business School running the first really big computer they got, which was an IBM 1401 that now would fit in 
one part of your wristwatch or something. And you, you want to know what Harvard Business School did with that big computer that we were working, programming, doing stuff with? Think market analysis, commodities trading. And so, you know what their first big project was? Alumni giving. So, I mean, they know where money comes from. And you talk about resources. They were interested in how they were being supported. So I want to throw it back on you. What kind of support do, can you envision what you want coming from, whether it's Asian generation teachers that Diana talked about, or previous you know, pioneer generations, what are you looking for? I do want to point out you do have an iPad sitting on your lap. Yeah. <laughs> it's not completely. Yeah. But, but I think it's an iPad 1. Oh. <laughs> True, I've been hankering after the iPad too, but <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, and and part of what I'm realizing, even talking about this, is that some of the resources that I've noticed are needed are not ones that it's even fair to ask. But uh, ask anyway, I think it's interesting. Yeah, but like some of them, I think, have to do with technology or support with, uh, you know, like how do you get people to support you in building websites and building. You know, community types of community projects that are, you know, I'm sure the ID project works a lot mm -hmm. with this. Like, how do you build such a robust online uh, kind of overlay on what's basically a in-person community? And those mm -hmm. things, um, it's of course, I'm not coming to you guys to ask you how to build those type of things. Good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you uh, how. I mean, we've been fortunate to have. I don't know if he's here yet, Alan Weiss our resident Buddhist geek, um, he will be here. And the way that we were able to have that support was, I think, one word, ask. I asked. At the end of a retreat, I was desperate. You know, I, was, I owed another $2,000 to the web guy for just doing simple things, and I just asked. So some of it has to do with, I think, being willing to this is what is happening and this is what we need to keep it happening. Mm. And some of the pioneer teachers are here, Shinzen, Ken, who are really paying attention mm. to this, especially mm. Shinzen is doing some pioneering things with mm. teaching on the internet. Um, but I think too, uh, coming back to what Ethan was saying about, yes, people want to hang out with each other, but they want to hang out with each other in a place where what they care about is uh, central and relevant. And so I think we are now addressing questions like money and sexuality and uh, work and kids and family and real life, everyday questions, how to balance our lives, ongoing question for all of us, especially overworked Dharma teachers. And this is different, really different, from when we were learning from our teachers. I didn't go to Asia, but I studied with the Asian teachers. And we used to ask them for advice about our relationships. You know, we forgot these. I remember my first teacher, he was a Korean celibate monk. And you know, people would go to him and say, I don't know what to do about my marriage. And he would say, well, go on a three-month retreat and do a thousand prostrations every day. <laughs> and when you come back, your mind will be clear and it will be fine. <laughs> that was his best advice. But I mean, we were working with people who didn't have the, they hadn't been out in the world, had a job, um, been in a relationship and um, had to deal with money in the ways that we all do. Do you feel like, uh, do you notice any similar types of gaps? Like with your younger students, do you notice the things that are like difficult to relate to or that like you notice you're kind of at cross, like you're just not hitting when you talk to them? Just wondering if there's anything similar going on now. I mean, maybe not you guys, you're pretty integrated. I, yeah, but it's <laughs> hard the to world, tell. But. It's hard because to tell. You would know. There's, there's a gap. At, they don't say. They don't say. You, you're really irrelevant. No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell us. They go and talk to the people that are. <laughs> I think you. Know, 
<laughs> I rely on the fact that suffering is suffering. You know, if people are hurting and they want to be free of that and they want to find ways to love and be loved and grow their capacity to love and care and live harmoniously. With, I, to me, this is pretty universal. I think where I feel the gap, and I don't know if you do, you know, maybe on the receiving end, is some of the metaphors that mm. I might use. Uh, finding the right metaphor that matches and maps onto enough of what you already know to be meaningful and connect you, while also then being able to draw into the unknown and um, what needs to be learned. That's an area that I feel it sometimes, if that makes sense. I also think in terms of uh, teaching, you know, I, I think that's the very subtle thing is that people, in terms of relevance or irrelevance, you're, you're never actually going to know. The, the way you're going to know is if you're relevant is if people show up again. That's, <laughs> that's the, the main way that, I mean, Nobody, you're absolutely right, nobody talks about irrelevance, they just fade away. They vote with their feet. Right, exactly. Um, or their sits bones in this case. Um, <laughs> but I, I think with teaching, I, I definitely experienced that a lot, a lot of times as a, um, as a young, younger student, that there was just culture, metaphors or cultural references or lifestyle references that not only, it, it wasn't that they weren't um, relevant to me, it's that they were very narrow. You know, so somebody would just talk about their their nine to five job, but wouldn't be able to reference global politics, or wouldn't be able to reference art, or wouldn't be able to reference television. And I think you know, I always try as best I can when teaching to have multiple cultural reference points in each talk that might correspond to different people's experience, not just to be like. Ooh, he, you know, he saw the wire or something like that. Not just to be cool that way, but to actually, I think we're trying to transmit, because I think one of the biases people have uh, about Dharma is this is a way that you subtly remove yourself from the world. And the more we know about different aspects mm -hmm. of culture and what's going on in the world right now and can thread different cultural references each time we give a presentation, um, the more we say to people on a very subtle subliminal level, this is somebody who's really curious and engaged about what's going on in the world right now and their practice is, is actually lets them know more about the world rather than just their narrow cultural um, strand of it. So I think that's, that's very important for teachers to work on really having a broad sense of what's going on in the news even, even when you know it's annoying politically, et cetera. But, and, and, what's going on culturally so that we can draw on multiple perspectives and at least transmit to students, this is somebody who's really engaged in the world because that's interesting to people. And I, oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I think this speaks to not just the age gap, but also, um, we reference it a little bit, but different cultures that when we're speaking from a predominantly, uh, let's say I as a white person, am I, speak, am I making references that people of other races, of other gender identities, sexual identity, you know, all of that needs to be included as well. And I think that when you look at, when I look at the changes that have happened in the last 20 years since I started my own Dharma practice, I think there's much more awareness now than there was certainly 20 years ago of these issues and that they're include, there's, I think teachers are a bit hipper. I won't say um, to this kind of thing, I won't say that that goes for all Dharma teachers at all, but but there's but that's part of it. There's more an awareness of inclusivity, exclusivity, and how to bring that in. And I'm I'm really happy to see that. That's a huge change that's happened since I first started. Yeah. So, so I, I want to kind of pose a question to you that builds on this, if I can. Um, and I have to be careful because I promise not to talk too much. <laughs> Let's see if it's anything like the question I was about to pose. <laughs> Do you want to pose yours No, first? please, pose your question. Um, in the, the generation from where, when I started and received teachings, or you did as well, Trudy, from, from teachers of, from Thailand or Burma or Korea and, and so forth, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the forms that the possibility of awakening or enlightenment were held in were monastic. They were patriarchal in some very severe ways. Um, they were author authoritarian. 
male dominated, all kinds of things like that. And in the last 30, 40 years of teaching and practicing, some of the things that have changed and that, that I'm happy to be a part of is that our, our forms of practice have become more democratic. As Ethan talked about, people's questions are invited and, and there's a kind of collective wisdom rather than just the teacher, the Sayadaw Ajahn Lama Rinpoche or whatever who has all the answers. And you go to some Lama and say, what should I do about you know, this baby that's coming and they've never had a baby, you know? Um, so it become more democratic, become more, uh, more feminine in that the Buddhism in, in Asia was kind of the warrior model of go out and, you know, conquer. And the Buddha was a, was a kshatriya, was a warrior. But instead, the emphasis on interdependence, on relational connections, on feeling as well as conquering, all of those things, and the fact that half the teachers in the West, certainly within our community of hundreds of teachers now, are women, not just women's voices, but the way it's expressed has gotten better. It's become a lot more integrated, less monastic. Um, integrated in the ways that Ethan talked about of psychological or that Diana references to in terms of diversity or engaged Buddhism, which you were a really big part of for years, um, culturally more integrated, and the fact that Dharma is supposed to be your life and your family and so forth. Those are some, I think, some of the initial successes in, in really in a translation. So my question is, all right, with that, and some of that's a given for people coming in, of course women are involved and it's more feminine, of course it's, we're allowed to question. That feels like just a beginning. What's the next step? What are the next generations of, of genuine integration and of making it alive now with that as a base? And I don't even know what they are. So that's the question. I think part of the answer to that question might be more and better. You know, I think that there are steps when I look at, when I, I'll just say this. So we were at, um, a Buddhist teachers conference, an international conference that was held on the East Coast a few weeks ago. And, um, and it was amazing. The room was filled with a whole array of people of all ages. It was not as diverse in terms of racial background as it could have been, but it was certainly very diverse in terms of male, female. Although I, I did read some statistic that there were a lot more men there than women. And, um, and there was a lot of, um, it was just very interesting to see that yes, people are blossoming and doing all sorts of incredible stuff. And you could see that each person had carried, um, carried their own dharma in a sense. And each teacher was taking that dharma out and manifesting it in the way that was most, they were most passionate about, that that was the most important for their own hearts and minds. And so you saw prison dharma and you saw people bringing it into, um, it, Pretty much, you name it. It was there. It was um, it was people who were bringing it in um, all around the world in all sorts of ways. So, so what I what I saw also was that there was a lot that was not examined and not cleaned up and not not as um, progressive as I would have liked to. Let's put it that way. Um, that this the history in the Buddhist communities of abuse that happened, for instance, sexual abuse that's happened to women in the Buddhist communities, that is not cleaned up. It's still there, it's still present. So for instance, I'll just take one of these threads. If I were to think about it moving on into the future, what's gonna change? I wanna see real egalitarian Buddhism, really women holding positions of power and strength that is not in any way second to, um, to men. And this is, so this is, a, this is sort of one of my visions. So another area of my vision is that family practice is integrated in a very deep way because it's, there's still the monastic piece where, oh, the monastic um, version is the best way to practice. I think that's, that lies in the back of our brain somewhere, maybe not for everybody, but certainly in the Theravada uh, practice that I come from. So that, that family relational practice is equally important. So I guess I'm just, I'm just, taking a couple of these threads that Jack's bringing up and saying how I answered it in the beginning, more and better. Yeah, thank you. Did you want to say something? No. Oh, okay. Vince does. <laughs> yeah, so, somebody's about to speak. Well, I, 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 
I'm wondering if it'll be more better or if it'll be radically different. Um, you know, when Shinzen gave his keynote yesterday, he pointed out that uh, when Buddhism entered uh, China, uh, it changed a lot more than when it had entered pre, uh, pre-literate cultures. And we're, of course, uh, in some ways, way more developed than China was. So he was sort of postulating that Buddhism is actually going to transform even more and that it'll impact the culture, but it'll be changed radically in the process. And I wonder if, I wonder if this first couple generations is just going to be the translation and then it's going to be sort of integrated and almost, I'm thinking like the Borg in Star Trek, uh, <laughs> where Buddhism in some sense could actually at least the forms it's taken could become completely, not completely gone, but just very, very minute forms. I wonder about that. And it's, it's sort of weird to say, considering I'm running a project called Buddhist Geeks, but um, in some ways I see that as a possibility, actually. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm open to that as a possibility. You know, if we build an enlightenment machine, what good is, you know, teaching uh, speci- like old technologies that are way less uh, useful, actually? So I, I just take a little bit more extreme view just to throw it out there <laughs> but I don't think it's actually that extreme I think it's actually like Shinzen said plausible mm. um, that's my sense of it I think there is a concern in the one of the directions that I've seen Buddhism go of course is what we might call or it has been called mindful society or secularizing mindfulness bringing the Dharma secularizing the Dharma and bringing it out into the larger cultural context And I think what we're seeing is what you're pointing to, that at a certain point, the word mindfulness stops having any meaning. You know, it's just being like used and used again and again. And then as everybody meditates, you know, I see the word mindful used in some of the silliest ways. I wish I could recall something right now, but you know, just just the the fact that, um, that it's sometimes like on the cover of Newsweek, you know, meditation, it's good for you. And so as that goes into the culture, is it going to diminish the power and what really can happen when one deeply dives into the, um, the practice? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's where I would go. Good question. Well, it's interesting what you were saying too, Diana, because we are teaching, um, we at Inside LA have a grant to teach mindfulness to the staff, to the clinicians uh, who work at the VA hospital with the veterans. Right now it's a train the trainers program, not so much working directly with the vets um, yet, although we have also had groups with the vets. And it's been very challenging because the staff are overworked, they don't have much time, they commute long distances. So the question is, you know, they don't want to take a lunch hour. We had these lunch and learns planned and And what we've been basically asked for, um, and this is a real challenge, is to develop something that is more like um, McMindfulness. You know, really fast food uh, for people that they can grab on the run. And uh, how to take these profound teachings, and I actually believe that some of this can be done uh, without it becoming just McMindfulness in the, trivial or not so good superficial sense is is one of our challenges how you know what will it look like when we have to deliver the practices and the teachings in forms that are more and more user friendly and related to people's actual lives and abilities to do them this is another huge question Mm -hmm. and it has to do with family and work and family too So, I don't know if other people want to chime in on this, but, I mean, Buddhist Geeks is a new form. In some ways, yeah. Maybe not now, but it was when you started. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sure. Although I wouldn't say it's like a radically new form. It's just, we, you know, we're podcasting. It's a slightly new medium, but the form is kind of still roughly the same. And what we're trying to do, to do um, at the VA hospitals is develop a menu so that people can choose the five, the ten minutes, um, you know, the eight-week course, the just a menu of choices. And I think that actually a lot of us as teachers are trying to develop more of a menu of choices to fit 
everybody's needs. Now, will that be radically different? Right. Don't know yet. Yeah. But inevitably, probably. Can I, um, can I just offer a one second Mick mindfulness practice? Okay, when I say three, on the count of three, everybody in the audience be mindful. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Be mindful. Did you do it? <laughs> Did you? Totally. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you want short, Mick mindfulness? There you go. <laughs> Pretty or good. It works. You can change your mind in three breaths. I mean, this is, especially if you count the inhalation and the exhalation as one. Mm. <laughs> or you can do the practice of stop trying to be aware. When I count to three, try not to be aware. Don't, <laughs> don't be aware of anything, not seeing, hearing, smelling, taste. Just try to stop being aware. One, two, three. Could you do it? No. <laughs> Come on. Be honest. And then you start to realize that awareness is actually here. And that instead of being in the content of experience, it's also possible just to rest in that awareness in a moment. But I want to talk about, um, for one second. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. It's uh, okay. I was calling on Ethan. Go ahead. No, please. <laughs> um, yeah, to this point, I think, you know, I think it's really framing, and I think there's something that we can say to people very simply as a sort of the reason you would meditate, the reason you would want to look at your mind, which is, you know, it, the, we have this culture of exercise and body health if people do it or if they don't, but everybody agrees it would be a good thing to do. And I think we have a major selling point, which is to say, your mind is at the root of your experience. You know, this is from, you know, one of the earlier suttas where the Buddha says, I can think of nothing better than a healthy mind and nothing worse than an unhealthy mind. And that's like a very perfect brand to say, that should be the, the core thing that a human being attends to every day. So I think then if you frame it that way, then the whole Mick mindfulness thing, sometimes you do need Mick mindfulness. In the, in the Shambhala tradition, there's, you know, there's a practice called wind horse, which can be, it's Mick mindfulness, of course, at the point that you learn that practice, which is the, the death practice, you've done a lot of retreat training. So I think that's the difference is saying you can have a little taste, but that, ha that taste has to be in the context of making a commitment to a larger way of living, which has to do with the idea that the mind is key. And, and so that you can recognize that right. taste when it happens. Right, but I also think we don't want to pander to people's speed and say, you know, oh, oh, you only have two minutes, therefore I'll give you a two minute practice. Say, actually, no, if you, the mind is key, if you believe that, and you do because you're struggling with your mind, and that's what you're telling me, Make an hour, make two hours, take a class, figure out a way that's more important than your iPhone right now. And actually, so I think there's a question of how much do we pander to the Mick culture mm -hmm. and how much do we actually say, well, the Mick culture sucks and you know it, which is why you're interested in this, you know? So come this way a little bit and then you can go back into the Mick culture with those little bite-sized pieces. It's I, like I, the healthy salads at yeah. McDonald's. Yeah, you know, get them, <laughs> switch them over. I, I think we can be a little bit more culturally interruptive sometimes than we think we can. And I think that's actually, if we actually hold our seat in that, people respond. They're like, oh, this person's not, they're not eating at McDonald's. And then they, they're smiling and I'm not. Mm. You know? Which also that's points... The key, that we also actually have to do that. We actually have to be yes. <laughs> happier people than people well, I was who just don't gonna say, you're, 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 <laughs> you're also pointing to the key point, which is we have to be somebody that someone else would actually want to be like. Right, yeah. If, in some ways. We got so, the, a few qualities. We got the Michael Jordan right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that I have a tremendous trust in this process. Um, and it make, may make whole new different forms. Uh, and I'm really open to that. And I, I, I was going to say, I wish I would be around. And I probably will be, although maybe not in this form, but some other one. So I think that that's fantastic. And anybody who wants to experiment, whether it's online or whether it's virtually or whether it's 
you know, some biophysical mental process, I think is fantastic. Because we have the capacity to awaken and, and the world is really created out of mind, as Ethan's saying. So whatever processes help that, fantastic. Secondly, we have the, a kind of notion that, you know, we have to protect the Dharma in some way that it could become dharma light or mcdharma or something like that but in fact if you go to um, burma or thailand or tibet or places like that um, it's the same thing you know most of buddhism in buddhist asia is um, it's beautiful there's a tremendous amount of devotion and generosity and i love all of that but in it's equally common to have people go in the temple, make some prayers for, you know, better gas mileage for their car or for their kid <laughs> to get into a good school and ask for a lottery number on the way out. And, um, and, and, and seriously, there's not a lot of interest in transforming their minds or hearts through these kind of practices. That's pretty uncommon. And maybe 10% of the monks meditate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seriously. So then you say, well, well you know, it's all gone downhill, but it's not actually. There's this huge field of a society that values Dharma in whatever ways they do, that values virtue even if they don't live up to it, they know the precepts and they know what it means to live with some integrity, that values the possibility of awakening. And in that field, there's always gonna be people who remember and wanna commit themselves. So if they come in for two minutes, maybe three years down the road or 10 years down the road, they're gonna say, now I have a kid and now my life has changed. I really have to get it together and I remember those two minutes and I'm gonna do more of it. So I, for me, it's like open the doors, open the store, give it away, find as many possibilities, um, support with resources and vision, all the different ways people are doing and trust that the Dharma, which is really who we are, wants to grow and wants to express itself. Um, that's, that's how I've been looking at it. So. Yeah, I think I felt inspired in that way. I was um, in the airport <clears throat> in Hong Kong in the transit lounge last night and uh, remembered I was coming here today. And so I was actually looking at some of um, Jane McGonigal's work and thinking, you know, this is also the activity of the Dharma that uh, when I think of video games, uh, I have this knee-jerk reaction, oh no, kids are playing too many video games. Or I think of my little grandchildren with their um, devices and you know, they just love them. They love their electronic devices. And, uh, and instead realizing, oh, this is also a portal into a world where people can practice some of the uh, spiritual strengths and virtues that we teach, some of the virtues of how to connect and be fair and um, operate with a certain amount of justice and collaboration and so forth. Uh, so along with what Jack was saying, it, it gives me a lot of trust too that these, all the new forms, that we still have our human hearts that long for uh, connection, awakening, love and recognition and so even though it may look radical, I'm sure Bora Boudour looked so radical to people in the ninth century. Uh, they'd never seen anything like that. Uh, it speaks to me, to us today, so. So can we offer any Q&A time or would you rather continue our discussion? We have a, we can. We have, what, 10 minutes? So we have 10 minutes. This might be a good time to open up and see if there are um, questions or comments. Yes. Okay, running out of control, you know, 
I mean, it's like that. Having the downside of our life to do with the less. Mm-hmm. All those kinds of things. And this is just the kinds of practices that we lose to make in focusing on interior life as opposed to exterior life might be very, very important in our whole development to deal with this challenge. I think you're right. I think they'll be very, very important. I think, too, that we don't make as much of a separation in a way between our interior and exterior lives. Um, that part of the pra- practice is to begin to understand how much of our exterior life is determined by our interior life. And just as I think somebody said, when people from the future look back on today, they might think it was really quaint that we made a distinction between virtual reality and reality reality that distinction will start to seem very quaint. Um, So the distinction between our inner and outer world, the practices really address how to harmonize more and more so that the outer world becomes an expression of what we most value in the inner world. And then there are practices of restraint and care that have very much to do. And then as Diana was saying, uh, a lot of the next generation of teachers are using their particular we would say um, karma, their particular talents and abilities um, in their own way, not just in the uh, DIY sense of, I'll just take what I like, leave the rest, but actually using each of our particular talents and abilities um, in the ways that address what we particularly care about or connect with, environmental issues, for example, and other people we want to also respond to that question. I think I'll just say that there's no better training for whatever difficulties are coming our way, and I know there's a lot of them coming our way. There is no better training than the work that we do internally to transform to create more wisdom, compassion, equanimity, ease, well-being, all of these qualities that our dharma practice invokes, creates, deepens. That's what we're going to need as things fall apart. Yeah, I would would kind of add to that, that, that I see that as one thing that's needed, but then there's also like a real need to like become familiar with some of these deep systems that we're changing and start to look at things in terms of systems and understand them and kind of be willing to let our let our current understandings of things fall away and actually die to our current systemic understandings of like how the world's organized what's our role in it i see that as part of of, of this as well like how do we let go in a kind of buddhist systems way i guess Mm -hmm. of the way things are now and start to look, you know, Shinzen talked about this sort of out of the box thinking. I love that. Mm-hmm. Just how do we actually let go of our identities, our systemic identities in some ways, which is connected to what you're saying. Yeah, so something new can be born. So there was, yes. Uh, yes, this is a question uh, you could ask. Uh, <coughs> according to the teachings, uh, Lived a number of people uh, were awakened. They were members of the Wahats. Um, and I remember reading uh, Adyashanti talking about being in a group of uh, experienced practitioners, uh, people who had been practicing for 20, 30, 40 years, and none of them would uh, talk about being a group. It was something that would happen. In another lifetime, lifetimes, uh, there seems to be a movement. At least I perceive that there, there is a movement. I think it goes to the name of pragmatic dharma. Of people talking about being personally awake, not perfect. I can't uh, talk about this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, wait. And I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts. Enlightenment. Um, I don't like to use the word enlightenment. I prefer to put an S on it. Um, Because when you talk about enlightenment, people have all these different ideas. Um, It's like talking about God, and then you have Jehovah and Krishna and Jesus and Allah. And 
pretty soon people are getting their armies ready and so forth. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's actually both healthier and more accurate to speak of enlightenments with a plural, <clears throat> just as there are many forms of gods, if you will, that represent something that's, that's beyond language or beyond word. Um, and the fact is that um, people who come and practice, I think within all these traditions, within the Zen tradition, within the Buddhist traditions of Vipassana and Theravada and Shambhala and Vajrayana tradition, that there are many people who are experiencing really profound awakenings and enlightenments in different forms. And there's a kind of cultural thing that we receive from tradition in Asia, from Japan or Burma or places where mostly you weren't supposed to talk about it. Um, so that, that's part of the receive. Um, but I think it's actually very healthy what you say to talk about it and to celebrate it and to understand that, that enlightenment is not in the Himalayas <clears throat> or in some long retreat in some monastery in the jungles, that it's here and now and it's always here and that awakening is really possible. So thank you for your question. And lots of people have this experience and know it viscerally, moving from suffering to liberation from suffering and to, to wakefulness. Yes. Did you want to add? Yeah, can I add just one? Please. I, I think there's <laughs> some obsession with um, enlightenment, and I think what students are really asking whenever they ask that question is actually, have you made progress? So I think we have to get out of this all or nothing proposition of what enlightenment is to begin with, and I think Kenneth started that by talking about two phases or two aspects. But the other thing is I think for me, and this goes to what I was trying to present, I think if we could talk about the progress we made, not in our meditation environment or our awareness, but in our post-meditation experience, like, oh yeah, I freak out way less when she doesn't call me back than I did 10 years ago. That's the kind of thing students <laughs> want to know. <laughs> Will this make you freak out less when the person you want to call you back does not call you back? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. <laughs> and yes, that's been my experience. On, on, on a good day. Yeah, on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think teachers should kind of recontextualize those conversations so that they're much more mundane and in, in the um, service of skillfulness in life rather than some um, yeah. exotic meditation experience, which the Buddha's whole system was about how the exotic meditation experiences are only a relative moment of realization. I mean, that's what separated him from the early Vedic me meditators who he studied with. So I think people want to know about realization in terms of how does this actually make you more compassionate in life. So I do think teachers should definitely talk about those types of progress in very mundane ways and not shy away from, especially the Tibetan system of, I don't, there's a, this tradition in Tibet of, I'm a schmuck, my teacher was enlightened. And that's just the way you do it. And I don't think that's really helpful either. Anyway. Well, it's misunderstood in our culture, too. Yeah. If you say, you know, I'm a schmuck, people just think you're a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They don't just think, oh, how humble. She's so humble. <laughs> Her humility just shines anyway. <laughs> yes. So there's a lot of talk about adaptability on our culture and relevance to the clearly there's a need for that. I have a question about some of this seems potentially to be a reaction to the institutionalized nature of things over the last 100, 100 years in the tradition. One of my fears with the people focusing on adaptability is, is the transmission of our generations. Sure, we can make changes now, people throw out a lot of forms of the they can contextualize how to run the future. But 100 years from now, will this still be promulgated? 200 years from now, 300 years from now, we can compare this to the more than 2,500 year old tradition. And there's a reason why it survived. I just want to say something very brief, and that is that every generation has both conservers and adapters to it. And when the Buddha died, the first argument that happened right around his funeral pyre was, we shouldn't change a damn thing, versus, but he said we should make changes. And those people have been reborn into this room here. We were all part of that argument. Um, and I have a lot of trust that there are going to be the people in Burma. There's a monastery where every word of the Buddha that exists was, is carved in stone, so it won't be lost. 
that there are people in this room who have, mm -hmm. you know, who have done the, um, the texts online and in, in, in ways that are going to preserve it. And they're going to be adapters and they're always in dialogue. And that's, that's actually us, that we are part of this mandala of living Dharma that's awakening itself through us. Mm -hmm. I would like to see if there are any females who would like to ask a question. Thanks, Trudy. Yes. Thank you. I mean, I, I mean, I can, we can all jump into this one. I practice yoga too, and I think it's one of the, what I would say for some Buddhist students is they need to get more in their body. They're under obsessed with the body, and and you know that there's there's body practices like yoga that are if they're understood from a from a mindfulness context or just really for me at least, just speaking personally amplify the ability to settle into my mind greatly. And that's actually what they were originally designed to do. Um, so I, I think it's really good to have not just a mind practice, you know. Um, I do, I use this image sometimes when I give basic mindfulness instruction that we should not view ourselves like a brain on a stick, which is a lot of times the way we just conceptualize, like brain looking down at something else. So. I think the body is really important, but you're absolutely right that there is this yoga culture of just like weird obsession with, with the body and, and that that's definitely a problem. I won't speak to the... You know, well, one, I think as a woman part. too, I mean, I, I'm sure men worry about their bodies too, but um, <laughs> Not we are so trained, no, <laughs> we are so trained to objectify our bodies and our bodies are being objectified as you point out with the billboards and the ads constantly and I see it through the children's eyes. It just shocks me, but we're so trained to that the body is a thing, it's an it, and we look at it, and we weigh it, and we dress it, and we bathe it, and we, you know, it's just an it. And so I think understanding the emphasis on the body and the practice with mindfulness, as Ethan was saying, is what is the experience from within of being this body? And so that's a different emphasis than what the body looks like, um, which is so much the emphasis of our culture. And then, of course, part of the maybe patriarchal culture is to have the idea of a woman's uh, very luscious, ample body that is associated with fertility in all the indigenous cultures. This is a good thing, uh, that somehow we should look more and more and more like boys. Um, this is very unfortunate. Do you want to add? Uh, no, I think we'll. There's just, there's so much. I mean, it's a huge can of worms. It's That's huge. Why I'm and not thank going you there, for but, bringing it. But can up. I, can I also, I'll just say this one thing, which is that I think that some of the practices that come out of the traditions that I practice can be profoundly healing for this issue you're talking about. The doing loving kindness practices, especially those practices directed towards yourself can absolutely transform the way we relate to our bodies and to the self-critical voices that so many of us carried. And those, those uh, billboards, those are just the outward manifestation of the self-critical voice epidemic that is facing so many people in our culture today. So we can heal it. That's the really good news is it can be healed. And that is radical. So it's our time uh, and I wanna thank Thank you for your interest and for the questions and comments. And thank you, uh, beautiful, brilliant panelists, for your thank contribution. You.